Smith had parlayed a career in prospecting into a $30 million fortune. He decided to use that fortune to challenge Southern Pacific's monopoly on interurban transit here in the Bay Area. Now, keep in mind that Borax Smith was also the largest private landowner in the East Bay. He reasoned, correctly so, that if he built a railroad on his property, that property would increase in value. Well, eventually, the real estate business drove Borax Smith bankrupt, but before that, he showed people how to build a railroad. It was born and grew up with a three and one quarter mile pier built right out into the heart of San Francisco Bay. There's not much left today, but in 1903, it was considerably more substantial. Though it would operate under a series of different names over the next 20 years, this was the birth of the key system. The first train rolled out to meet a connecting ferry boat in October of 1903. The Trans Bay hookup was 20 minutes shorter than the Southern Pacific run, and 20 million 1903 commuters decided the key was the way to go. For the first time, the Southern Pacific had serious transit competition. The key system pier, rebuilt in 1916, probably reached its peak in 1924 when 800 trains a day brought passengers to the ferry boats. But the competition that resulted gave the Bay Area an excellent interurban transit system. Southern Pacific and the key system often ran down the same street on their own lines with a third key system local train on a third set of tracks, all on the same route. Southern Pacific stood up to the competition admirably. By 1911, SP electrified all its interurban cars and introduced the brand new and aptly named Big Red Cars. However, Southern Pacific was a giant conglomerate and the key system a privately owned company. But the key survived and in fact flourished. But eventually, like all the others that crisscrossed Northern California and the Bay Area, it disappeared. By 1958, it was gone, but it died a slow, gradual death. The opening of the Golden Gate and Bay Bridges and the love affair with the automobile led to the demise of the ferries first, and then the trains, despite the important role the key system was playing on the Bay Bridge route. The transit loss, in light of today's needs, was nothing less than tragic. We had a cheap, efficient, practically pollution-free transit system, the nucleus of what could have been the best and most extensive in the world. The frustrating thing, I suppose, looking back, is that if we had put some public money, a modest amount of public money, into the key system, the trains on the bridge, the local streetcar lines, built some trolley bus lines, we would have had a terrific transit system. And maybe some of these neighborhoods in Oakland that have since deteriorated or have become industrialized or something, we may have stayed as commuter neighborhoods because it would have been worthwhile to live in those neighborhoods and commute to San Francisco or commute to downtown Oakland. The key system lasted until 1958. But in 1939, both the Key and Southern Pacific began to reduce service. But it was also the year the Key began running trains on the Bay Bridge. It also marked a critical time for repair and upgrading on other existing key lines. Well, they weren't repaired, but if they had been, it's doubtful we would have ever needed BART today. Even after the trains go on the Bay Bridge, we see the thing in decline. And the issue really is, if you look at it from, a, from an economic and political say, situation, the issue is, should decisions have been made in the 1940s to take what was there, which was obviously in decline, and rebuild it and modernize it. Because we all know it's an awful lot easier to fix something that's there than to build something brand new. Okay, the, there, was, there was enough there in 1945 that with modern equipment, both on the streetcar lines and on the trans bay lines, that, you, that that system could have been modernized for far less than what it cost to buy AC, to create AC Transit 20, 15 years later, obviously more than it cost ever to build BART. People were taking to the auto, the two bridges were open, the trains needed upgrading, but something else happened to speed the demise of the Bay Area's interurban system. What happened was illegal, and the giant American corporations involved were all found guilty by a jury in a federal court of law. In 1949, General Motors, Standard Oil, Mack Truck, National City Bus Lines, Phillips Petroleum, and others were all found guilty of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. They systematically dismantled rail service all across the country and replaced the rails with buses. For this, they were fined $5,000 each, hardly enough to throw any of the involved corporations into receivership. 
Some rail systems disappeared literally overnight to be replaced by autos and buses. Buses which were built by General Motors and Mack, fueled by Chevron and Phillips, and rolling on tires built by Firestone. Solely at the pursuit of profit, at the expense of the common good, these corporations proceeded to bury a transit system that was indeed sick, but it was far from dead. A man by the name of Roy Fitzgerald was the front used by General Motors to carry out what was to be a fatal assault on the country's mass transit system. In 1933, Fitzgerald and his brother ran a small bus line in Kentucky. By 1936, Fitzgerald was the chief operative of National City Lines. It would have been a public relations blunder for General Motors to go out and buy up the existing rail lines and replace them with their own buses. So in effect, they hired Fitzgerald to do it for them. And for his efforts, he was given a bus company. National City Lines, with money loaned from GM, would buy the rail lines, tear up the track, tear down the overhead wires, and as night turned into day, buses had replaced the electric cars. So complete was the corporate arrogance of the companies involved that their agreements with National City Lines stipulated, of course, that all buses, tires, and fuel be purchased only from the conspirators, but also that never, which I estimate to be a long time, never could any new transit system buy any kind of streetcar that didn't run on gasoline. The profit motive has always been a strong staple of American economic history. But what General Motors, Phillips Petroleum, Mack Truck, Firestone Tire, and a few others did in pursuit of a dollar is simply breathtaking. The electric streetcar of the first 40 years of the 20th century had received its official death sentence. In fact, all but the key in Southern Pacific had disappeared by early 1941. If those other systems had been allowed to hang on until World War II began, our transit history would undoubtedly be different. In 1941, you had the key system on the Bay Bridge, you had the Southern Pacific red trains on the Bay Bridge, you had the Sacramento Northern interurban trains that went all the way to Chico, but they had a nice little commuter business in Contra Costa County, and you had the Northwestern Pacific electric trains in Marin County. That's all, you can say that all of that was in place on January 1st, 1941. On December 7th, 1941, the day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, only the key system was left. Now, if those, if that's, those systems had survived into December of 1941, it's very obvious what would have happened. They, they would have run all through World War II. And then again, the situation may have been different. It may have been, then Marin would have been growing. Then Contra Costa County would have been growing. And the Sacramento, you know, the bark, the bark between Walnut Creek and Concord is on the Sacramento Northern tracks, the right of way. So again, here you had these systems being abandoned right on the eve of World War II, that if they had survived another year to six, six months to a year, they, they would run all the way through the war. And it's pretty obvious they would have. And then maybe the decisions would have been different after World War II. So that's kind of a frustrating thing. In 1941, before World War II, there were only about 27,000 people living in the entire Marin County area. But they were transit blessed because they had one of the finest transit systems to be found anywhere in the Bay Area. Yet it disappeared so fast and so completely by mid-1941 that today there are only a few signs that they even had a transit system here. But it was a good one. have long since disappeared, and the ruins of the concrete passenger platforms are barely visible through the undergrowth. It's hard to tell now, but from 1903 to 1941, Marin County had a marvelous commuter system. But it didn't last for the simplest of reasons. It didn't make money. Marin never really had the people in those days to sustain such a large transit system. In fact, Marin's population didn't really take off until after 1950 by which time the Northwestern Pacific was already a distant memory. A couple of things happened. One, it didn't have very much ridership. Two, the ferry boats took a long time. Three, the Golden Gate Bridge was a very, very effective competitor. Fourth, the Southern Pacific really didn't care about it. I mean, it was, it was to them, it was a drain on them. And it, was, it probably just was built too early. The, the, probably the, fr the frustrating thing about the Marin County operation, these electric trains, was that when they didn't need them, they had them. Now they need them, and they'll never get them built. You see, it's, it's, it, it really happened again. It happened too soon. And by 1939, 1940, when it was really obvious the thing was going to disappear, there just wasn't that many riders on it. Nowadays, I mean, you'd be nuts to get rid of it. But for those who rode it, it was a wonderful experience, whether you rode it from Fairfax to San Rafael or all the way to Sausalito for the ferry boat trip to San Francisco. It was a more easy mode of transportation. In fact, when they 
the Greyhound took over on March the 1st in 41, that uh, they kept telling us that it was going to be more efficient, faster, and it took an hour and 20 minutes instead of an hour and five minutes to get to the, the ferry building. Uh, the trains were much more efficient. You could get up and move through the aisles. You were placed in a bus. You, you had to stay seated. Actually, you couldn't move up and down. The trains, you could move from one car to the other. They had a smoking session, non-smoking session. Any commuter line is going to live or die on its efficiency. But the Northwestern Pacific was more than efficient. It was fun. And those who rode it remembered it as nothing less than one of the finer things in life. Sometimes Santa Fe had as many as, uh, oh, uh, I would say working in the urban and the steam going north, the Russian River, Sonoma Valley, they went to Santa Rosa Local, they had, uh, I would say there's 23 to 24 trains a day came through Santa Fe, it's a passenger train going to Santa Rosa, like I say, or to Glen Ellen, or the Russian River. They were great, they had, uh, God, we used to get the, you get on the, your bathing suit and the, the family get the, uh, the lunch packed and uh, many a time, I remember standing at Maribel Park when the big bands were there, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, they all played there and I saw them all there. <laughs> But in 1941, the ride was over. When Greyhound assumed control of the line, it disappeared so quickly and so completely that it was almost as if the train had been an embarrassment rather than a vital commuter line. That seemed to be the general rule of thumb for dead and dying transit lines all around the Bay Area. Just weeks before the start of World War II, cars that could have been a tremendous plus for the war effort were carted off and burned. Others were shipped off to South America where, believe it or not, some of them are still running today. system and the Southern Pacific routes and the East Bay and how they came over into San Francisco. We've also looked at the Northwestern Pacific Line in Marin County. But that was just the tip of the transit iceberg in the Bay Area. There were many more good solid lines, including one which left here, the Trans Bay Terminal in San Francisco, and went all the way to Chico, California. One of the least known was also the longest interurban train in the United States. It was called the Sacramento Northern. Let's say you took a key system ferry from San Francisco to the Key Pier. From there, you would take the Northern, whisk through the Oakland Hills, past Walnut Creek and Concord, take a ferry car across Susan Bay, on to Sacramento, where, after a short layover, you would continue on to the almond capital of the world, Chico, a total of 180 miles. This is especially mind-boggling when you stop to realize that the Sacramento Northern was still considered an interurban line. It ran from 1905 to 1941. But the Sacramento Northern, like the Key System, Southern Pacific, Northwestern Pacific, the Peninsula Railway's Blossom Line in San Jose, and the almost forgotten 40 line, which ran from San Francisco to San Mateo, all did more than just carry passengers. They gave life to the cities and towns they served. When the trains died, a little bit of life also oozed from those cities and towns. The presence of a rail system and a trolley bus system in downtown San Francisco kept the downtown vital. There's a, there's a real lesson here. The lesson is, is that when you put a transportation system 
in place that is fairly immovable. It's not, you don't go down and tear the tracks up every five minutes. You don't move things around. The trolley bus wires are there. The same bus comes by every day. The same streetcar comes by every day. You build a sense of permanence into your urbanized, in your, in your, to your downtown area. You know, it's, you know the streetcar is going to stop in front of the Emporium. You know that the 30 stock and trolley bus is going to stop in front of Macy's. Okay, so the, the real estate community can make some investments in a downtown because it knows that the transportation system is not, is not going to be, not going to be gone the next day. Okay. What happened in Oakland, of course, is with the one-way streets and all of these other patterns and changes and the conversion to buses, the transit routes could be moved around and they could disappear. It was very hard to make an investment decision in downtown Oakland based on parking lots. I mean, what, what kind of downtown is that? San Francisco recently spent $60 million to restore its cable car system. Now, today, this is a line which is basically a tourist attraction. But there was a time in San Francisco when the cable car system kept this urban transit system vitally alive. The type of car running on the Powell Street line today was virtually the same type used in the 1880s. The cable cars have survived to the present, but mostly as a fond remembrance of times past. By the turn of the century, electric streetcars had taken over. San Francisco has always been known as a streetcar town. A boast not always adhered to was that every 22 seconds a car left the ferry building loop. There were four tracks on Market Street. The inside two were for the white front cars run by the privately owned Market Street Railway. The outside lines were for the city-owned Municipal Railway. It was not uncommon for people to talk, almost casually, of friends crushed to death in the chaos of Market Street Transit. But the system worked, and today San Francisco was one of only seven other American cities to still have a streetcar line. It was a love affair that has endured, but for most Bay Area interurban lines, the bloom was off the rose by the 1930s. Through the late 30s, what, uh, rail transit was dying out all over the West. Uh, in California particularly, in Los Angeles, lines were being cut off. Of course, people weren't patronizing some of the lines either, but um, on the other hand, some of the profitable lines were in the way of freeways, and so that was another reason for eliminating them. But the ones around here, up till 41, were disappearing at a rapid rate, and we were photographing them in the expectation that we would never see rail rapid transit again. By now, I think we have an idea of the enormity of the interurban transit system that graced the Bay Area. But to see it is to believe it. The Blossom Line to the south, from Palo Alto to San Jose and as far south as Los Gatos. The 40 Line, which ran from San Francisco to San Mateo. The Northwestern Pacific, from Manor in the north to the ferry terminus in Sausalito. The Key System in Southern Pacific, which crisscrossed the entire East Bay over into San Francisco and the incredible Northern Line, which ran from San Francisco to Sacramento, then north to Chico, 180 miles. Believe it or not, there were two other lines not shown on this map, the San Francisco, Napa, and Calistoga Railway, and the Petaluma, Santa Rosa Railroad. In 1932, a prestigious California commission was formed to determine the transit needs of the Bay Area. And keep in mind, this was 1932. They came to two major conclusions. One, that we needed a rail line between San Francisco and San Jose. And secondly, that we needed a Transbay Tube. Well, 51 years later, we've got the Transbay Tube, and we've got BART. What we want to know is, was it worth the wait? BART is a case of beauty being in the eye of the beholder. You can't help but admire the sleek, smooth, quiet trains Yet at the same time, you only wish BART would be what it was promised to be. I think BART is a terrific uh, rail system. I just wish they'd operate it the way it was designed. I wish they'd spend a little, pay a little attention and, and, and uh, run it on the schedules it was supposed to be uh, operated on. My feeling is that uh, I don't have any basic problem with the design and construction and even the financing of BART. What I'm waiting for them to do is to run the system somewhere on time and somewhere with some sense of uh, urgency. It seems that BART has settled for something less than it could be. 
It runs 16 trains in one direction per hour, not the promised 40. 349 trains travel on the 71 miles of track on a given day. That is half of BART's capabilities. To put that into perspective, let's take a 60-year step back in time. The key system ran 600 trains a day, one minute apart, to the waiting commuter ferry boats. And while making more stops along the way, the old key was still almost as fast as BART is today. When the key was running on the Bay Bridge, it took 28 minutes to travel from University Avenue in Berkeley to San Francisco. Today, it takes BART 27 minutes. When you consider the fact that the key system was a privately owned, profit-seeking venture, and that BART is a $1.7 billion publicly subsidized operation, that one minute difference becomes a mighty expensive proposition. But to be fair, let's look at it in a slightly different light. BART is all we have today, and even though the system is less than what was promised, we do need it. BART has been, a, an, an, after its bad start, has given people a chance to, uh, to rely on it, to get reliable transportation across the bay. And I noticed the other day, a couple weeks ago, that I came back 4 o'clock from the city, from downtown Montgomery Street, and we had a 10-car train, and we were standing up. And no one was complaining. <laughs> they were glad to get on it. It was something I did. I'm just thinking, suppose it's 10, it must have been 1,000 people, at least 1,000, because there were full of, 10 cars full of standees. So that would be maybe 500, 600 cars on the bridge, each one of those trains. We would be dead without BART. In 1962, when the voters decided to fund BART, it was only four years after the last key system train ran across the Bay Bridge. It didn't take people long to realize that a wonderful interurban transit system was lost and that something had to replace it. BART was the answer. It's a good train. It's needed. It's also so frustrating that it is not what we paid for. All of us who were born or came here after 1941 missed something that is hard to put into words. We had a transit system that was simple, clean, and efficient. It was a part of our lives. It made commuting less of a chore. What we had can never be as it was, but a reasonable facsimile is a part of our future. We saw it all disappear, and we went on the last ferry boat rides, went on the last trains to all these various places, and the last runs at the local streetcars in Oakland. And we thought that was it, because there was no way we could see them, them ever making a comeback. They were private companies. They had no money. Even when they were running, they had very little. So we saw them start to come. We see them all over the West now springing up. There's a trolley line, for instance, Seattle, Portland. San Jose's got one. Sacramento's got two lined up. San Jose's building another one now. San Diego, I mean, is building another one. It's been so successful. So I guess it's going to be the thing of the future again. Throughout this series, we've tried to show that for the first 40 or so years of this century, the Bay Area had a wonderful rail transit system which linked Marin, the East Bay, and San Francisco down to the peninsula. It's gone now, but truly not forgotten, because the lesson has been learned, and it is. <laughs> and then I said, okay. hold on, I get to skip the counter and pick my car as a Gold Plus Rewards member? Sign me up for that! Sign me up, baby! Sign me up right away! I had no idea you were so funny!
in Marin County trying to save the Baltimore Park substation here behind me. It's now an abandoned shell that the Northwestern Pacific Historical and Technical Society want to make into a museum. They are seeking donations, and if you'd like to contribute or want more information, please write NWP Railroad Historical and Technical Society, P.O. Box 4413, San Rafael, California, 94913.